Well, good morning, Grace Bible Church Logan, and welcome to our online service for this week. Uh, my name is Jason. I'm one of the members and one of the elders here at Logan. For all those regular attenders and members of the church, I say hello. Uh, I know I can't see you, but I miss you all very, very much. For those who may be joining in with us for the first time, we say welcome as well. And we encourage you, once lockdown lifts, that you would join us in person so we may meet you and get to know you a little bit better. Well, this morning, unlike last week, we've actually had some time to prepare a service. So we've got a bit of a jammed, packed, packed jam service this morning. Uh, we're going to be hearing a testimony shortly from Finn Johnson, one of the newer members at Grace Bible Church Logan. Uh, we're going to have a short video later in the service for the kids to watch and discuss with their parents. We'll be praying together, although we'll be separated. In spirit, we will certainly be together. And of course, we're going to sing songs and, and hear from God's Word as Pastor Dave shares uh, from Genesis chapter 37 and 38 this morning. Before we get there, however, I thought it would be good to turn to the Lord's Word to focus our mind and hearts upon Him. So if you have your Bible, I would encourage you to have it open to Psalm chapter 46. Now for many of us, it's been a rather strange week. We got notified of lockdown last Sunday, which of course changed all of our plans for the weekend. And we got another notice of an extended lockdown throughout the week, which is obviously why we are meeting now. See, we don't know what the next few weeks holds for us, either personally or as a community. And this can breed a degree of uncertainty. And uncertainty can be a real plague, a real plague upon our hearts and our minds. See, but it's not just uncertain to be at the situation of lockdown and the situation around COVID and vaccines. See, people in our congregation have uncertainty about many things, about their jobs, about their health, about their families. They have uncertainty about the things that they hold near and dear to their hearts. But there are three things we can do this morning as we come before the Lord in worship as a congregation. Three things. First thing we can do is this. Don't panic. The Lord knows and he is indeed in control. The second thing we can do is this. Think about things which are certain. What can you be certain of? The third thing is this. Look at the one who brings about certainty. And that is the Lord our God. This is the reason why I want to turn to Psalm 46. See, Psalm 46 is a favourite psalm for many. But not just many people in the modern time. It's been a favourite psalm for God's people throughout history. It's a psalm that reminds us of God's power, His authority, His past works, and His future works. And it directs our focus towards Him. So can I encourage you in these uncertain times, think of the words of Psalm 46, and even more so as we read them now. Psalm 46, we're going to be reading from the CSV, CSB version of our Bible. And I encourage you to read along with me. Let's read together. God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. Therefore we will not be afraid, though the earth trembles and the mountains topple into the depths of the sea, though its waters roar with foam and mountains quake with its turmoil. There is a river. Its streams delight the city of God, a holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is within her and she will not be toppled. And God will help her when the morning dawns. Nations rage, kingdoms topple, the earth melts when he lifts his voice. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, see the works of the Lord who brings devastation to the earth. He makes wars cease throughout the earth. He shatters bows and cuts spears into pieces. He sets wagons ablaze. Stop your fighting and know that I am God, exalted among the nations, exalted among the earth. The Lord of armies is with us. And the God of Jacob is our stronghold. Well, I do pray that the reading of Psalm 46 would help you to focus your hearts and minds upon the Lord this morning. But before we go into song, how about we just commit the service to the Lord in prayer? Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Our most gracious God and Heavenly Father, we come to you in times of uncertainty. This is true. But we also know that you are the one who brings about certainty. You are the one who knows the start from the beginning and nothing takes you from surprise. 
So in that, Lord God, we do ask that you would help us focus our minds upon you this morning, for you are the only one who is the same forever. Help us this morning to lift up our hearts and lift up our minds and our voices in song, wherever we may be, and let us declare the truths about who you are in song, that they may impact our hearts and our souls this morning. We do pray that as we hear from your word later, that Lord God, you would touch our hearts and that you would open our hearts to receive your word and that indeed you would be at work by the power of your spirit. Until we meet again in person, we pray that you would bless our time with you this morning. We pray that in Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing together. Morning, church. Uh, hope it's... Uh good to uh, join us in, uh, with, in song this morning and there's a couple of familiar faces for you and uh, so just uh, join us this morning as we sing His Mercy is More. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more.
singing those truths wherever you may be in the lounge room, the dining room, or maybe even on the back deck. Hey, th before we continue on with the service, there are a couple of quick announcements that I want to go through. Uh, we don't know what's happening with lockdown. Well, at least when I'm recording this video, we don't know uh, what's happening with lockdown. If it does continue, uh, our grace groups will be meeting online, well, most of them will be at least anyway. They'll be meeting online through the Zoom platform. So reach out uh, either to me or one of the other grace group shepherds and find out uh, whether or not they'll be meeting. Uh, one thing about meeting online is some people can't usually get out at night. Um, so meeting online is a good way that you can actually join a group uh, when you couldn't previously join a group. So I encourage you to do that. Uh, even more so if this uh, lockdown is extended, um, it's a good way to keep in contact with people from the church. Uh, another thing, uh, we are in Judges chapter 6 starting of Monday. Uh, so in our Bible reading plan, if you haven't got a Bible reading plan, join on with us with the church. Uh, there's a link on the Facebook site in regards to where we're at. But now, look, now in our service, we're actually going to continue on with it. We're going to actually have a kids video. So kids, uh, stick around. We're going to watch a video together. And then Finn Johnson's going to come and share a testimony. Then Kailani's actually going to read our passage this morning. And then straight after that, Pastor Dave is going to come and preach from Genesis chapter 37 and 38. So enjoy the rest of the service. God bless you. And I'll see you when I see you. Bye. God's story. The good news. So part of God's story is about the gospel or the good news. And it goes like this. In the beginning, God made everything. The sun, the moon, stars, planets, the entire galaxy. And earth was part of that creation. God made mountains and oceans and forests and deserts and animals that crawled on the ground and flew in the air and swam in the water. Then he made people. Adam and Eve to live in a garden called Eden, and God called everything he had made good. There was just one rule. Adam and Eve could eat anything they wanted except for the fruit from this one tree. But a snake tricked Adam and Eve into disobeying that one rule. Because of that, sickness, sadness, and all kinds of bad things came into God's perfect creation, all because people made wrong choices. Part of how God punished Adam and Eve was by not allowing them in the perfect garden anymore. And if that were the end of the story, that would be bad news for us. That would mean all the wrong stuff in the world would never be made right. But God still loved people, and he had good news for them. He was going to send a rescuer. So they waited, and waited, and waited. Then one day, the rescuer was born as a baby named Jesus. Christmas is when we celebrate the good news of Jesus being born. But it's not just that he was born, it's what he did later that was the best news of all. He took the punishment for all the wrong choices that anyone has ever made anywhere. 
see, all of us have continued to make wrong choices, just like Adam and Eve did. And just like Adam and Eve, we deserve to be punished for our wrong choices. But here's the thing, Jesus the Rescuer never made a single bad choice. Kids, think about a time you made a bad choice. Maybe telling a lie, or taking something that wasn't yours, or hurting another person with something you did or said. Can you believe that whatever that was, Jesus never made a choice like that? And even though he never made a bad choice, he still took the punishment for our wrong choices? And then Jesus did something even more completely unexpected. He came back to life. Really, you can read about it in the Bible, in the stories written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We call those books Gospels, which is just an old fancy word for, you guessed it, the good news of Jesus coming to earth, dying for our wrong choices, and coming back to life. That's what we celebrate on Easter. But not just because coming back to life is totally amazing. By coming back to life, Jesus was showing that God can make anything new. There's nothing God can't do. He's more powerful than any sadness, shame, wrong choice, disease, disaster, and even death. And that's the best, most amazing good news of all. It's so amazing, Jesus' friends told everyone they could find about the good news. And those people told other people. And those people told other people. And on and on. And that's still happening today. In fact, you just heard the good news. And the Bible says, <clears throat> If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's another way to say God rescues us. And that rescue includes you, your friends, your family, and anyone else in the whole world. And that's the story of the good news. So, in case you missed it, here's the quick version. God made a perfect world. People made mistakes and the world isn't perfect anymore. God promised his family a rescuer. The rescuer's name is Jesus. Jesus died to take a punishment we deserve, but he didn't stay dead. Jesus came back to life because Jesus can make anything new. And that's a part of God's story. Genesis 37. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. These are the family records of Jacob. At 17 years of age, Joseph tended sheep with his brothers. The young man was working with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought a bad report about them to their father. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons because Joseph was a son born to him in his old age, and he made a long sleeve robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not bring themselves to speak peaceably to him. Then Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. There we were binding sheaves of grain in the field. Suddenly, my sheaf stood up, and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. Are you really going to reign over us? His brothers asked him. Are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and told it to his brothers. Look, he said, I had another dream. At this time, the sun, moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. He told his father and brothers, and his father rebuked him. What kind of a dream is this that you have had? He said. Am I, your mother, and your brothers really going to come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Verse 12. His brothers had gone to pasture their father's flocks at Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, Your brothers, you know, are pasturing the flocks at Shechem. Get ready, I'm sending you to them. I'm ready, Joseph replied. Now down to verse 18. They saw him in the distance, and before he had reached them, they plotted to kill him. 
They said to one another, "Oh, look! Here comes that dream expert. So now, come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. We can say that a vicious animal ate him. Then we'll see what becomes of him and his dreams." When Reuben heard this, he tried to save him from them. He said, "Let's not take his life." Reuben also said to them, "Don't shed blood. Throw him into the pit in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him, intending to rescue him from them and return him to his father." When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped off Joseph's robe, the robe of many colors that he had on. Then they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty without water. They sat down to eat a meal, and when they looked up, there was a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were carrying aromatic gum, balsam, and resin going down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, "What do we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come on, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay a hand on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh." And his brothers agreed. When Midianite traders passed by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the pit and sold him for twenty pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw Joseph was no longer there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, "The boy is gone. What am I to do?" So they took Joseph's robes, slaughtered a male goat, and dipped the robe in its blood. They sent the long-sleeved robe to their father and said, "We found this. Examine it. Is it your son's robe or not?" His father recognized it. "It is my son's robe," he said. "A vicious animal has devoured him. Joseph has been torn to pieces." Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth around his waist, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, "I will go down to Sheol to my son, mourning." And his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and the captain of the guards. This is the word of the Lord. Hello, church. On Wednesday, Matthew asked me to write a testimony about how I came to Christ, so that I could present it、uh, for this week's service. So here I am. Now my testimony is not exactly like the testimonies you might have heard on YouTube about drug addicts going to becoming missionaries or like prisoners becoming pastors.、Uh, now whilst externally externally I never experienced I never committed such offences. In essence, I shared and even do share the same problem as them, and that is sin. Sin is falling short of God's standard, a crossing over of His law. And a corruption of what is good. Essentially, it's rebellion against God, and at the heart of it, self-idolatry, worship of oneself. Now, I was very good at doing it, so proficient at, at sinning. You didn't have to teach me anything about the matter. You know how people rave on about how, how people are born with natural talents, or just born to do a particular thing, or worshiping myself was was my thing. It was a thing that I didn't even have to think about doing. Or put any effort into doing it. Wherever I was, sin was there too. Where I stood, it stood there, in the very shoes that I was wearing. Why? Because sin was a part of my nature. Sin pervaded my whole being, my emotions, my desires, my will, my imagination. No part of me was untouched by sin. I was a living, breathing animation of what sin is. Drink, eat, sin. Drink, eat, sleep, sin. All day, every day, sin. So, because my life was sin, all I ever did was experience sin. All I ever knew was sin. Knew it and experienced nothing better in life than sin. At times, sin was enjoyable and pleasurable. In moments of hardship, it was comforting, like cold water to a thirsty soul, or a Big Mac to a hungry stomach, or a buzz to an impassioned and motionless mind. So, sin was what I fed off. A, con- a constant supply of food. Wherever I was, always ready to eat. However, whilst this was true, I liked a particular type of sin over others: self gratification, self exaltation, pride. Now, unlike sin as a whole, this type of sin was not constantly avail- available. This sin had to be achieved, so I worked hard for it, trained real hard in basketball, 
The team winning didn't matter so much to me. It was more about what I could do on the court. The problem for my sinful self was that this dream of self-exaltation, self-gratification was not being achieved. And so my fuel for existence was the very thing that was killing me. It would drive me to despair, self-pity. While sin would have its pleasures, it would also bite. Like drinking tasty poison, delightful and refreshing for one moment, but painful and gut-punching the next. The more I indulged, the more suffering I received. But in my mind, I had no other option, because in my mind, the only option was me. In my desperation, I made sure other people paid for my experience. Physically violent to both my parents and my brother, and I wouldn't even care afterwards. Now, we could, could leave my sinfulness there, but that would be an understatement. Whilst I have talked about sin, I haven't highlighted the one whom I've sinned against the most, who is God. In all this time, He deserved my devotion and my praise, but rather than praising and worshipping Him, I was exalting and worshipping myself. The very creation that points to the Creator, I was trying to bend to point to me. However, one day this changed. God changed me. He changed my nature. I couldn't do it. No part of me contributed, just like a mere dead man could not bring himself back to life. I wasn't a part of this at all. Now the day of conversion I don't know as prior to this point I experienced a lot of external change in my behavior that I accredit to legalism. Someone who doesn't care about spiritual things but then suddenly cares for the purpose of trying to get to heaven by their works can have a radical change in behavior. Maybe in some of those YouTube prisoners to pastor testimonies are testimonies about people finding Islam. The difference here is that I don't just appear different, but there is something fundamentally different in me. See, God became valuable. His opinion mattered. His opinion of me mattered. I knew I needed to be forgiven. So I believed the news that in the past meant nothing, but now means everything. That Jesus paid for my sins, past, present, and future, so that I would be reconciled to God. I couldn't say myself, even the good things I was doing, were not good things, as the external actions were immersed in sin. The only perfect and good one, who would have been still perfect in, send me, in sending me to hell, took the, the hell punishment that I deserved on my behalf. What sin was to me, my life, my comfort, is now what God is to me. And that's all because of Him. He died so that I would die to sin. He lives, reminding me that one day I too will live completely separate from my sin. So, as I live this life, I look to Him. And even though I fail miserably on, a lot of, on frequent occasions, I remind myself that He still stands pleading. And He's still, he still forgiving me, having forgiven all of my trespasses. And even if I look at my life in, in, the past event, in the past events of how I've changed, I realize that I do things that I would never have done as a non-Christian, like preaching the gospel, like even reading the Bible, something that I didn't value whatsoever. I remember people giving me Bibles to read, but I never wanted to read them before I became a Christian. But even my approach to life in general is completely different. I realize that it's, it's not about me. It's about the one who died to take the punishment for my sin. And so on a fundamental level, my, view, my viewpoint or my, my worldview of the life is, has changed. The world is not here to serve me, but to serve Him. And that's something that I, that I would never come to realize or never wanted to, to realize if I hadn't have become a Christian. Um, and so, yeah, I'm very thankful for how God has changed me. And I shall forever be thankful um, because in no way could I have saved myself. Well, thanks for participating in our online service, Jason and Finn and Kailani. And uh, I suppose really the only announcement that we have is a, a, maybe a, something to think and pray for is just pray. If camp happens, if the Lord wants it to happen, it'd be great to have it at the end of the month. Who knows what he will do? I'm hankering to get together with people face to face if we can. But let's also pray for uh, our situation in the country and uh, people in our service. So why don't I pray? Lord in heaven, thank you for the privileges that we have daily, the, the health we take for granted, the freedoms that we take for granted, some of which at the moment are restricted. And we pray 
that that helps the common good. We pray that wisdom would pervade uh, through our governors with a very tough job, with it's hard to please people who are extremely concerned and those less so about things like virus and spreading and freedoms. And so, Lord, grant us patience and wisdom, grant the government balance and care to pursue the best interest of all. We pray, if it's your will, that we would be able to gather at camp and, and to focus on prayer and fellowship. Lord, we also pray for the Whitaker family. Thank you that um, Andrew's had all his tests now. He's going to be in the hospital a few more days, but just pray that uh, you would be able to move the radiation treatment up. Thank you they found uh, what's going on with the bleeding on his lungs. Show mercy, we ask. As you have to Noreen's sister, Ashley, we're thankful for uh, the way her surgery has gone well. May you prevent her from secondary infection and we pray that she would lean into you. And Lord, now as we've had a passage that has just been read and the chapter after that that hasn't been read with a few cautionary, a few cautionary and provocative things, grant us eyes to see the depths of our sin, but the, the greatness of your grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Olympics are currently on in Tokyo, and uh, in fact, I hope you're tuning into service right now rather than watching the Olympics. Uh, but in the Olympic spirit, I thought I'd share a brief sporting clip about never losing hope. It's not last ice skater standing Steve Bradbury. We've seen that a hundred times, and it's not actually the Olympics. It's a soccer match in Thailand, but I want you to watch the blue jerseyed penalty shooter, how he turns from deep despair to glorious gratitude. <laughs> On his knees, hands and face to the sky, thanking God for something rather trivial, a soccer goal. Uh, what if you're despairing about something rather significant, uh, failing to get a grip on dangerous habits, or patterns in your life that are wrecking relationships, wrecking work relationships, church friendships, family relationships? Uh, maybe you're lacking purpose in life, lacking hope that you can be useful once again, or lacking hope that you of all people can be forgiven and accepted. Deep despair needs a bigger hope, moral hope, spiritual hope, eternal hope. The Apostle Paul, before his conversion to Christ, was a zealous Jewish leader who used to hunt down and arrest many Christians seeking their death. Paul, also known as Saul, back in Acts chapter 7, leading the execution of Stephen by stoning. He then continued his campaign to imprison more Christians until Jesus stopped him in his tracks on the road to Damascus in blinding light. Facing Jesus, Paul the big sinner needed a God of even bigger grace. See, astoundingly, rather than strike down Paul the persecutor, Jesus showed grace, forgiving and saving Paul, even calling him into Christian ministry. And so Paul would write, I am the least of the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am saved, called an apostle, but by the grace of God. That's a precious phrase that was paraphrased by a 16th century reformer and preacher, John Bradford. He saw a group of prisoners being led to their execution in England. And in seeing them on their way to be executed, Bradford confessed, there, but for the grace of God, goes John Bradford. And that's our, 
for many Christians, that has become a phrase that many would rightly say, there, but for the grace of God, go I. That's our title this morning. Uh, a reminder that we're all guilty convicts, imprisoned by sin since birth in need of God's grace, a greater grace than our sin. And as we turn the page to a new section in Genesis, we see a growing need for God's grace, not only grace to save, to save Paul and others, but grace to sanctify, to sanctify Pastor Bradford and others to grow. You see, all the people in Genesis 37 and 38 are morally compromised. Some in need of spiritual birth, salvation. Others in need of spiritual growth, sanctification. And our main idea is never lose hope in the God of grace to save you and sanctify you. Our outline, for chapter 37 at least, reintroduces us to our cast of characters, uh, and characters they are. Uh, each one experiences some sort of boomerang effect of their sin coming back to bite them. So we see in chapter 37, law reaping what we sow in a preferential papa, a taunting teen, bitter brothers, and a broken down dad. Then comes chapter 38, where by God's grace, he meets us at our lowest point, but only after opening our eyes to our own lowly lousiness. And that is grace, light exposing our darkness. Uh, how low can you go? And then a broken down bro. It's here God does his deepest work, giving grace to the broken. So uh, chapter 37 is really the introduction to the whole section of 37 to 50. And chapter 38 is where we see the deep work of God in a human heart. Let's get into the law and reaping what we sow. Now, if you're wondering, did we skip chapter 36? Yes, you are insightful. That's because it is simply the genealogy of Esau. Uh, these are the family records of Esau, and it's a very long genealogy. 72 descendants are listed. So I spared you reading through that, but 72 is a significant number because 72 is also the number of nations. If you remember chapter 10 in the table of nations, nations that represent every future nation who would be blessed through the promised offspring of Abraham, the Messiah. Because the covenant promises of God at this point in salvation history revolve around the promised land and the nation Israel leading to Messiah, commentator Gordon Wenham wrote this tragic summary of Esau himself. When Esau left the land, he walked out of the record of saving history. Nonetheless, the gospel will be shared with even Esau's descendants because Jesus the Messiah died to redeem people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, including some of those descendants of Esau. So chapter 36 in a nutshell, Esau has heaps of descendants, heaps of stuff, and lots of rulers and chiefs as sons. Jacob has 12 sons, but he now lives in the land. Chapter 37, Jacob lived in the land with his, with his, where his father stayed, the land of Canaan. And these are the family records of Jacob. So this is the last section. And it focuses predominantly on Joseph, the fourth of four founding fathers in Israel. The Joseph narrative gets more chapters than any others in Genesis, more than Abraham even, and Isaac and Jacob. So much space because it so clearly in so many ways points us to the grace of God found in that promised one, Jesus Christ, whom we'll consider more in weeks to come. In chapter 37, it's the best known probably of many of the chapters in the book of Genesis, and it's mostly self-explanatory. So we'll skim through it, highlighting key bits. The chapter begins telling us Joseph was a young shepherd, 17 years old, working alongside his half-brothers, and he brought a bad report about them to dad. Now, probably it was an honest report, but likely mixed with some brotherly bias. 
Uh, either way, young Joey is acting like a school hall monitor, daubing in people, in this case, his brothers. The school hall monitor, the guy everybody loves, not. Everybody loves Raymond, not everybody loves Joseph, except for dad, preferential papa. So much sin comes back to bite in these chapters, but the first we see is favoritism. Jacob was the clear favorite child of his mother, Rebecca. So Jacob has become one of those parents who are incredibly obvious about who their favorite child is. You may know some of those parents. I hope you're not one of them because it's not healthy. Israel, verse 3. Israel or Jacob loved Joseph more than his other sons because he was born to him in Jacob's old age. Let me translate that. Joseph loved, Joseph was most loved because he was the firstborn of Rachel, the most loved wife of Jacob, not born of Leah. You see, despite being deceived into marrying Leah, we saw how much Jacob's favoritism for Rachel damaged Leah, creating jealousy and wreaking family actually in the whole family. And when Jacob had to face Esau again, recall how Jacob minimized his risks, splitting his estate into two camps. And which camp did he send to the front line? <laughs> Leah's and Leah's descendants, the, the less loved. And so Jacob continues this favoritism in his parenting. Oh, that caused further division. Now jump back to verse 3 and into verse 4. He made Joseph a long-sleeved robe. Some old, old translations say many colored. When his brothers saw that their father loved Joseph more than all his brothers, they hated Joseph and could not bring themselves to speak peaceably to him. Thanks to dad's obvious, visible partiality and favoritism, the other sons came to feel inadequate and grew into spiteful siblings. You know, the robe or coat that's either full length or long sleeved. It's only used twice in the Bible, so it's hard to know. Either way, in ancient times outside the Bible, that was the robe of management, not labor. So Jacob sets young Joseph in a class apart and above, exempting him from menial tasks. Already acting like the school hall monitor, Dobbin and others, to add insult to injury, the pimply-faced teen has now been promoted to assistant manager over workers nearly twice his age. Not so wise parenting towards a very young man. A young Joey was likely very polite, but hardly without fault. See, Joseph graduates from being a tattling teen to a taunting teen. Verse 5 says, Joseph had a dream. When he told that dream to his brothers, well, they hated him even more. See, that's because the brothers, they interpreted the dream being about their grain bundles or sheaves bowing down to Joseph's standing sheaf. And they interpreted it correctly that Joseph would be their ruler. And we see that fulfilled in chapters 43 and following. The dream is from God. It's prophetic. However, God did not instruct Joseph, make sure you tell this dream to your brothers, you know, just to rub it in a little bit. Now, friends, especially when it comes to comparative truths, uh, you will bow before me. Uh, heaps of things are true but that doesn't mean they should be shared or broadcast. <laughs> My exam score is higher than yours. Oh, I didn't know that, but now I do. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
I make more money than you. Uh, at ECA, my apple pie got a higher award than yours. Those might all be true, true, true. But here's a truth from the book of Proverbs. Let another praise you, but not your own lips. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, young Joey. Friends, think through what true things you choose to say to others and post on social media and why. Will it actually bless others or will it make you look better than others? Seeing the brother's reaction of disgust, if Joseph was wise and humble, he would have refrained when he got a second similar dream, the sun, moon, and stars would bow to him, but he did not refrain. Since dad was the sun, mum the moon, and bros the stars, Joseph could have privately asked dad, hey, what, what do you make of this dream? Do you think there's anything to it? But he didn't do that. He raised the stakes, sharing it publicly with dad and the brothers together, shouting Martin Luther King style, I have a dream. Oh, I have another dream. And they're about me and you. See the difference? On Instagram, Joseph would call that publicity, hashtag humble brag. But there's nothing humble about it. It's arrogant taunting. He has become a taunting teen. Jacob actually rebukes Joseph for dishonoring his father. He didn't have to share that. And yet Jacob kept the saying in his mind, verse 11, granting it might be a divine pointer to the destiny of his son, as hard as it was to hear. Dad gave only a rebuke to Joey. The brothers, the bitter brothers, however, gave something extra set up for a fall by dad, quite honestly, and by his own pride. Uh, assistant man manager Joseph is sent to check up on the brothers who are out grazing the flocks at distance but lush fields back up in Shechem. When his brothers see Joseph coming from afar, um, quite the opposite of the father of the prodigal son running to embrace, the brothers Cue the mustache, Mu-ha-ha. they're planning to rid themselves of this dream supremacist. Verses 19 to 20. Oh, look, here comes that dream expert. So now, come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these pits or cisterns. We can say that a vicious animal ate him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. Mu-ha-ha. See, with somewhat questionable motives then, the eldest brother Reuben steps in in verses 21 to 22. Reuben heard this. He tried to save Joseph from them, and he said, let's not take his life. Don't shed his blood. Throw him into this pit in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. And then the comment from the author Moses, intending to rescue him from them and return him later to his father. So Reuben wants to come back save Joseph. The angle he took to buy some time and let anger calm was, you know, hey, if we throw Joseph alive into the pit, well, we won't be guilty of shedding blood. Um, hey, the end result will be the same because there's no water in there. He can't get out. He'll, he'll die of dehydration. And then they sit down and have a feast right next to him. Precious brotherhood. All the more precious since chapter 42 is clear that Joseph begged for mercy. As the brothers years later and now in big trouble reflect, obviously, we are being punished for what we did to our brother. We saw his deep distress when he pleaded with us and we would not listen. And this is why trouble has come upon us. It seems it's Reuben's rotation to check the flocks because he, he walks away and brother Judah steps in to seize the opportunity. Cha-ching, uh, becoming one of the first cash converters in the Bible, saying to his brothers, what do we profit? If we 
kill our brother, let him die there. Come on, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. So Judah pawns off Joseph like a cheap hand-me-down, selling him into slavery to a convoy of merchants headed for Egypt for 20 silver coins. Divided by 10 brothers, two coins apiece. You know, a, a word of application. All the brothers share some guilt. Joseph, though he did not deserve this, certainly, he was tattling and taunting. Reuben, he had more of a just and measured reaction, but he too was one of the Joseph haters, remember? What was his ulterior motive? Well, if you think back to the end of chapter 35, Reuben, the firstborn, he had fallen into disgrace with dad and he, because he slept with dad's concubine. So planning to be the one who saved Joseph and brought him back, he said, to return him to dad, they tried to kill him, but I rescued your favored son. He was hoping to get back in the good books with dad and regain his chance at the birthright and the blessing. But Judah particularly is guilty of both coveting and envying. Cornelius Plantinga reminds us of the difference. He says to covet is to want somebody else's good so strongly that one is tempted to steal it. To envy is to resent somebody else's good so much that one is tempted to destroy it. A coveter has empty hands and wants to fill them with someone else's goods. An envier has empty hands and wants to empty the hands of the one envied, resenting not only somebody else's blessing, but also the one who has been blessed. See, Judah didn't just want what Joseph had. He wanted to ruin him. You know, few of us would allow envy to be carried as far as Judah took it, selling somebody into slavery. But envy has far more subtle effects that can be almost as damaging. You see, James writes, wherever there is envy, there is every evil practice, James 3.16. So here are a few self-assessment questions for an envy quiz, since our might, ours might be more subtle. First, do you often think that others have more than they deserve, whereas you are just unlucky? Well, if that's a pattern, see, that's not just judging circumstances, that's judging character. You're saying they're getting better than they deserve and you're getting worse than you deserve. Again, do you choose to post things, just remind you on social media that you think will make you look better than others, smarter than others, or more successful than others? This is such a temptation. I've got to say with the stuff going on in the political world and the nonsense going on in the theological world, I've had to reassess some things because I've been sharing some rub it in the face kind of posts that um, I'd have to admit, I think, in studying this passage have been more to make people look dumb, dumber than me. And that's just not right. We take every thought captive to Christ. We don't assassinate people. Hitting closer to home, for me, probably for many of us, does your competition in sports, board games, the workplace often lead to personal insult or even injury? You see that successful coworker who got the promotion you were hoping for, perhaps your envy will not drive you to seek their dismissal, but it may lead to that steady onslaught of, you know, put downs and, and ridicules, trying to make them look bad at every opportunity and in the process, make yourself look better. By comparison. You know, you could substitute from coworker to sports teammate or your brother or sister, and it's the same. We express concern over their poor performance to the management. We chuckle at their blunders, we mock their naivety, 
devaluing them as individuals, but putting ourselves forward as above such faults. That, friends, is the more common face of envy. And we need to learn to recognize its green color in our mirrors if we are to overcome it. As the chapter wraps up, Joseph is the primary target, but dad is the collateral damage. We meet a broken down dad in Jacob. As Jacob was dece- sorry, as Jacob deceived his own dad, Isaac, with goat skin, if you recall. So now Jacob's sons deceive Jacob with goat's blood, dipping Joey's robe, splashing it in goat blood. Look at your Bibles at verses 34 to 35. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth around his waist, mourned for his son. Many days all his sons and daughters tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I shall go down to Sheol, to the grave, to my son mourning, and he wept for Joseph. That's just, that's sad. You know, in the school of hard knocks, Jacob's faith is being refined by three generations of relatives. First, Jacob graduates from hard knocks high school with Uncle Laban. Then he did his graduate course facing brother Esau, and now finally his postgraduate course with his sons, the third generation. You know, tragedies multiply when everyone is looking out for number one and putting themselves first. And that's pretty much what happens throughout chapters 37 and 38. As we turn to chapter 38, I want to highlight that chapters 37, actually to 39, they form a unit. We're going to look at 39 next week, but it's hard to see this in the English translation, but... Jacob, Judah, and Joseph all went down in Hebrew uh, because this is the story transitioning from the story of Jacob to Judah, uh, sorry, to Joseph, but then Judah is also a significant player. And in each of the three chapters, a clothing garment or accessory is used deceptively as evidence. Joseph's robe, used deceptively by the brothers. Judah's signet ring and staff, used deceptively by Tamar, his daughter-in-law. And then Joseph's new robe, used deceptively by Potiphar's wife. I'll highlight this just to show these are a stylistic unit. And therefore, it is no accident what comes in chapter 38. It's not misplaced. It's, It's very deliberate. So when chapter 37 ends... Meanwhile, the Midianites or um, Ishmaelites, similar people, are sold, uh, sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guards. We're hooked in suspense. What's going to happen to Joseph, poor Joseph, in Egypt? Chapter 38 is meant to feel like an intrusion, a derailing of the Joseph narrative as the private life of Judah gets a huge double click. You see, his his life and character are a key part of the larger narrative. Um, Jacob's three eldest sons, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, have all fallen out out of favor with dad. So what will happen to son number four, Judah? Here we see grace from God, light exposing darkness, and it's really dark. How low can you go? Well, we see that. In this chapter, the Bible says bad company corrupts good morals. And Judah chooses poorly in marriage and in friendship. And verse 1 says Judah broke away from his family. He became best mates with a Canaanite, Hira or Hiram of Adullam, a place best known for the cave that King David would later take refuge in. So his best mate is a Canaanite. Verse 2 says he married a Canaanite named Shua, also Bathshua. Judah's dad, Jacob, was told, do not marry a Canaanite. Judah would have known better, but he didn't care. Now, remember God's concern with marrying is not a Canaanite. It's not race or ethnicity. It's, it's false worship and idolatry, and that leads to immorality. See, when, when Moses or Boaz married 
non-Jews who worshipped Yahweh? No problem. But here we see Judah's best mate and better half are both unbelievers, two most influential people in his life. Each time Hiram is mentioned, Judah gets into more trouble. And Judah's kids, I don't know what the two of them, uh, Shua and, and Judah, were doing as parents, but they're shockers. Uh, the only thing said about son number one is seen in verse 7. Heir Judah's firstborn was evil in the Lord's sight, and the Lord put him to death. Wow. The key is here, remember the blessing and the birthright, the double portion of the inheritance that would go, for Judah, the inheritance from Judah would go to the firstborn. Well, now the heir is dead, Onan, the second son, that double portion falls into his. Now, Onan, the second son, is no better. Look at verse 8 as it talks about a widespread custom, very weird to us. It's called leveret marriage. Leveret is Latin for husband's brother. Verse 8. Judah said to Onan, Sleep with your brother's wife Tamar, perform your duty to her as brother-in-law, and produce offspring for your brother. You see, leveret marriage operated on the principle that a family was responsible to continue the name and family line of the dead brother. Deuteronomy 25 encourages but does not require a brother to marry his dead brother's widow. Or if there's no living brother, it could be a near relative. In that little book of Ruth, there's a big illustration of this custom when Naomi sends Ruth, her widowed childless daughter-in-law, to Boaz, a near relative of her dead husband, to seek marriage. But back to Genesis 38, the key in leveret marriage is that the firstborn son of that union becomes the legal heir to the dead brother's estate. Onan knows that if he and Tamar have a son, that son will take back the double portion of the estate that fell into his hands when his older brother died. So in verse 9, rather than a friends with benefits kind of arrangement, Onan attempts a wife with benefits, but without birthright, as he spills his seed to prevent pregnancy. Totally selfish, fully evil in God's sight. Verse 10, God takes Onan's life also. And that leaves son number three, the last son standing of Judah, his name is Sheila. Well, you got to love that if you're an Aussie to call a son Sheila. But that aside, long story short, Judah is superstitious. He thinks Tamar is cursed. She's going to kill his last son. So he says, sweetheart, go home to your family. When Sheila is old enough to marry, I'll give you a call, but don't call me. <laughs> Sheila gets older, but Judah never calls. Judah's wife has gotten older. She dies. We don't know why. That's made Judah himself a widower. Now, not a Hebrew law. This is not biblical, but a Canaanite custom. If a son is not given to a widow in leveret marriage, a widower father marries the widowed daughter-in-law. That sounds so creepy, but Judah is now a widower. So Tamar seeks justice according to Canaanite custom and seeks an heir through Judah himself, verse 12. And so she hatches a plan, as we saw last week, two wrongs do not make a right. Her approach is wrong. <laughs> but news reached her that party boy Hiram of Adullam is bringing Judah, snap out of your doldrums, you widower. It's sheep shearing festivities, and they're known for drinking. Now hear this. Such was Judah's reputation that Tamar was confident that she could get the better of him by posing as a prostitute. That does not speak highly of Judah's character. Now, being a pay-as-you-go sin, Tamar bargains with Judah for a goat. 
less for milk, meat, and feta cheese, more because she knows Judah does not have a goat at a sheep shearing festival. So that means mwahaha female style, uh, she gets to ask for collateral. Verse 18, she says, well then, in collateral, till I get my goat, give me your signet ring worn on a cord around the neck. Now that was pressed into wax. A signet ring is, is equivalent to our signature. And give me your shepherd's staff. Each shepherd had a unique and distinctive staff. A staff drives the sheep, and we could say it's equivalent to our driver's license. She's got his signature and his driver's license. Fast forward three months, and word gets back to Judah. <gasps> Tamar's pregnant. Hypocrisy to the max. Judah responds with... <laughs> righteous indignation in verse 24, bring her out and let her be burned to death. This was his opportunity to get rid of her and his obligation to her to give her, his son Sheila. This guy is a scum bucket, a self-righteous scum bucket. She masterfully and publicly unveils her evidence in verse 25. Oh, before you burn me, wh whose signet ring and staff might this be? He's caught out like Nathan to David saying, you're the man. Tamar to Judah, you're the man. And now this man is a broken down bro. Our society might think having one's darkest deeds exposed is the worst thing that could happen. Social media, shame, whatever. But this exposure is the best thing that ever happened in Judah's life. It's the best thing that happened to despicable Judah. To awaken him to the state of his soul, like Paul on the road to Damascus, so that Judah could be saved, made new, and made useful. It's here the penny drops for Judah in verse 26. Judah said, she, acting like the prostitute, this cursed, vexed woman, is more righteous than I. Suddenly, this self-righteous jerk this brother-betraying, whore-hiring, daughter-in-law-denying, and daughter-in-law-defiling Judah realizes that he is the chief of sinners. How low can you go? Well, Judah hits rock bottom, and it is in our humble brokenness that God does his deepest work. You see, following this, each speech that Judah gives and each action Judah takes is more commendable and honorable than the previous one. Judah, Judah just owns up to everything. He is a changed man by God's grace. Just a sneak peek at a verse in chapter 43. I won't tell you what's happening, but Joseph has to be brought to Egypt. Judah said uh, to his father Israel, send Benjamin the, your youngest son, with me. We will be on our way so that we may live and not die, neither we nor you nor our descendants. I will be responsible for Benjamin. You can hold me personally accountable. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, I will be guilty forever. And he just keeps owning up and being part of the solution. It is the grace of God to let the light of truth in to expose the darkness of our sin. She is more righteous than I. There, but, but for the grace of God, go I. So let's consider closing application for the Christian and for those not yet Christian. Especially if you're not yet a Christian, you might be thinking, clearly Joseph is our man, is God's man. I mean, chapter 39, it's going to be pretty striking that in a lot of ways, he's the opposite of Judah, the opposite of rude, crude, and lewd Judah. 
So much in this passage points to Joseph as being a type or sign of Jesus, the Messiah, who is to come. At the sharing of that prophetic dream back in 37 verse 11, Jacob kept the matter in his mind as he hoped, is Joseph the Messiah? That language in the Greek translation of the Old Testament is identical to the Greek in Luke 2.31, where another prophecy is shared about Jesus and Mary pondered these things in her heart, kept these things in, her, in his mind, pondered these things in her heart. It's the same. You see, Joseph is a pointer to Jesus. <laughs> They're both a shepherd, beloved by the father, sent by his father to find his brothers, sold for pieces of silver, and through this infamy of betrayal, becoming their savior. And yet, friend, the line of Messiah, the scepter of rule will be through the tribe of Judah, not Joseph. So that everything is by God's undeserved grace, so that you cannot boast, so that I cannot boast before God except in Christ alone, dying on a cross to take our shame and blame and guilt, to make us right with God and save us and bring us into God's family forever. Jesus, the Savior of, of strangers, the Savior of the world. Despicable me, Judah, was saved because he saw this grace expose him and the glory of God. Tamar, the prostitute pretending Canaanite, is in the lineage of Messiah. Ruth the Moabitess is in the lineage of Messiah. And by faith, you can be too. I pray you would gloriously bow your knee to him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in him alone and worshiping him. Be saved this day. Now for the Christian and being sanctified, don't lose hope. God's grace can sanctify you. We need to keep working on humility. It doesn't just happen and stay. See, Paul, the mature, godly missionary to the world, as a Christian, in the present tense said, I am the worst of sinners. <laughs> Not I was, I am. Paul wrote that his goal is to help every Christian be mature in Christ. And Paul showed us the way. Keep on viewing yourself, me, myself, us, ourselves, as the worst of sinners. See, there are many people in chapters 37 and 38, and there are many sins in chapters 37 and 38. Reflect on where you can personally insert your name here in this chapter, this passage. There's probably ample places, be it envy, be it vengeance, be it immorality. If you can't seem to do that, that is the problem. We also need humility in speech. As I think about what Joseph was bombastically broadcasting and our potential with media and others, uh, I've just been thinking when referencing sin, wh whether it's amongst ourselves as Christians or sharing the gospel to the world, I think when we reference sin, we need to use a lot of me and we language. Uh, sinners like me, uh, like us, or, or how we need Jesus. Not always you, you, you. See, this helps us. Even when we go to help a brother or a sister. See, Jesus said this, first, take the log out of your own eye. Why? Then you'll be able to see clearly to help your brother deal with his sin. Oh, how young Joseph and older Judah needed to heed that. And so do I. There but by the grace of God go I. Never lose hope in God's uh, grace to sanctify you, for it is his grace that's greater than all our sin. 
His grace saves and sanctifies. And I just want to very briefly conclude with John Newton. I thought as, as um, Joseph traded his brother into slavery, it'd be good to consider another former trave slater, uh, <laughs> slave trader uh, from disgrace to amazing grace. This is what he said after his conversion to Christ and reflecting back. And he said, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I'm not what I hope to be, but I can say, I am not what I used to be because of God's amazing grace to the worst of sinners, to me, to you. Let us pray. Oh, our God in heaven, what, what a passage of darkness, but what glorious light to break through Grace and truth to expose who we are. Oh, but grace and truth found in you, the word taken on flesh. Grace and truth who reveals our Father in heaven. Thank you, Jesus, for coming and saving and for sanctifying. Help us, Lord, now, oh, as we sing of grace alone, how we need to meditate on your gospel grace, to continue to grow in that grace for your glory and for our good. Amen. Well, on your couch, wherever you are, please, please sing heartily, Grace Alone.
Thank you so much for singing and, and just to be honest, bothering to gather and watch and worship. And I just hope that your soul is thrilled. And if you have questions, maybe you're watching this online or you haven't yet come to Christ and you have questions, please give us a call or email us. The website has those details. And uh, for us who are Christians, um, rejoice in the Lord. Uh, be amazed at His grace. And uh, speaking of which, grace groups are on, at least at the moment, by Zoom. I think we're having an announcement this morning about what's going to happen. How much more important while we're maybe segregated and in, in lockdown to try to have digital fellowship. It's not the real thing. Ain't nothing like the real thing, baby, but it's close. So strive for that. And let's be praying for camp and uh, that we would be able to gather again soon. Th thank you for gathering this morning. Talk together as a family about the astounding grace of a God who calls and saves and makes useful the Judas. Amen.